Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the British Library's 29th Talk Science event. Um, my name's Peter Spooner. I'm at, working at the British Library as an intern, uh, and I've been organising this event. Um, so now I'll introduce our lovely chair, Dr. Helen Scales. Um, Helen is a biologist, author, and broadcaster. Um, she got her PhD from Cambridge, um, looking at the trade in reef fish, and she can, she's written two books, one of which is she's bought a few copies of the long uh, to sell at the end. If anyone's interested, you get a signed copy. Uh, so if you are interested, speak to Helen at the end. She's also appeared on BBC Radio 4 quite regularly on programmes like um, Inside Science, Shared Planet, and recently on the Life Subaquatic and Inside the Shark's Mind for the BBC World Service. Um, so with that, I'll pass you over to Helen to introduce the rest of the panel and the topic of discussion. Thanks very much, Peter, for that lovely introduction. And um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's really fantastic to see so many of you here. Um, and I know that um, I think there are people in the room who've come from various different backgrounds. Some of you may be experts who know perhaps more than some of us up here, which is great in particular areas. Um, so I think we've got the chance to have a really, really good discussion um, um, about um, the topics tonight. And we're going to leave that, as Peter said, to the second half of this evening. So if you do have any thoughts of questions or things you would really like to talk about or bring up while the panellists are introducing themselves and doing a bit of talking, um, just note those down. Um, and, uh, and then after we've had a chance to recharge our glasses and um, we reconvene after the break then that will be your chance to to ask questions so um, so just keep a note of any thoughts you have and we'll dig into those in a bit um, and I'm really looking forward to that discussion um, but first we are going to have um, we're going to do a bit of talking um, about the topic tonight which is um, the fishing and marine protection and in particular, I think what we want to do if we can is have a very positive discussion about um, finding solutions to the, the problems of the oceans, the problems the oceans face, and the problems that the fishing industry faces as well, um, rather than maybe just dwelling on those issues and problems, but well, what can we do to, to help? What, 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 how can we look forward to a future of, of good fishing and healthy oceans as well? Uh, because as I'm sure many of you know, seven-tenths of our planet uh, is covered in ocean in seawater and and that ocean matters to us in many many ways um, from my perspective as a marine biologist turned writer and broadcaster um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about and talking about the oceans and the things that live there uh, and I'm especially fascinated by the connections between people and the oceans um, for most people, most of the time, the oceans and the creatures that live there are out of sight and out of mind, um, but there's so many ways that they, they do matter, and all of this matters to us on a daily basis. Um, and uh, they range really from very practical, direct benefits that we take from the oceans, one of which we're talking about tonight, fishing and food, um, but it you know, ranges all the way through to really, I think, much more intangible um, perhaps more whimsical uh, connections that we have to the seas. Um, in fact, and one of my favourite quotes from another writer who's written about the oceans, John Steinbeck, um, uh, said um, that an ocean without unnamed monsters would be like completely dreamless sleep. Um, I love that. It comes from a book he wrote called The Log of the Sea of Cortez when he went with a marine biologist, Ed Ricketts, and surveyed invertebrate life in the, um, sea of, well, in the Gulf of California. And he wrote a lovely book about his explorations. And that was one of the things he wrote about. So this idea of there are monsters in the sea and it inspires us, that's the sort of thing I love to think about quite a lot, including in um, my latest book. Thank you, Peter, for the plug. Um, I have a few copies if anyone's interested. It's called Spirals in Time. Um, it's a book about seashells. And really, the reason, one of the main reasons I chose seashells as a topic is um, because it encapsulates, for me, this breadth of the connections between people and the seas. So, on the one hand, shells, seashells are these objects of wonder. They're beautiful things. We find them on the beach, and people have pretty much always wondered what they are when they found them um, in this strange place. You know, where have they come from? And we've really, for thousands of years, instilled great meaning in seashells. Um, you know, going back to sort of seven and a half thousand years ago, there were Europeans who were buried with wonderful uh, jewellery made from shells. Um, even further back, maybe a hundred thousand years ago, the first shell beads were made. So I love all that kind of whims the whimsical connections and the beliefs we have in things like that. So people burying themselves with whole shells miles and miles from the sea. 
Um, but seashells are also the animals that make them. We eat them. Um, sea shellfish is a huge source of protein. It's an important source of income for lots of people and has been for a long time. There's evidence now that maybe 125,000 years ago, um, early humans migrating out of Africa were perhaps eating giant clams from the Red Sea. Um, so we've been eating shellfish and mollusks and seashells uh, for a long time. And still today we are. They're really important. Clams, mussels, oysters are all being farmed and, and, and fished from the oceans and eaten in huge quantities. So that's kind of where the book for me was. It was this mixture of, it is this mixture of, of human uses. And I think many other aspects of, the, of our connections to the oceans is kind of captured in this idea of a seashell. Um, but coming back to fishing and food, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, and that, I think, really is the most tangible use we have of the oceans. It's the food we, we eat, um, it's the, the jobs that create, um, and it's a big, big issue, and it's something that we can all find a connection to, because most of us do eat um, some kind of seafood. One in five people around the world rely on the oceans for their primary source of protein. A lot of us just like eating seafood because it's tasty. I certainly do. And, um, but that, um, that fishing is historically one of the most kind of convoluted and troublesome relationships we have with the ocean. Um, in recent years, we've become increasingly aware of the problems the oceans face from overfishing, declines in certain species, um, from the impacts of certain types of fishing gear, um, and then you've got the added complications of things like climate change and pollution and so on. But um, at the same time, and I think perhaps the focus of tonight will hopefully be that we're actually in a better place now than we ever have been to deal with those problems, that we have a suite of solutions that are getting ever better, a better idea of what we can do to tackle these problems. So I think we are at a really interesting point of time at the moment with knowing what's, what's, what's going wrong, but also really getting a better idea of, of what we can do to make it better. So, to discuss these issues, which are very huge. We were saying beforehand in the green room that this discussion could go in all sorts of directions. So it would be really interesting to see what you would like to talk about afterwards. But we'll get the ball rolling um, with some introductions to what our panel um, are interested in and, and what they've worked on and some of the main issues. And we'll see where it goes. I think it's going to be great. Um, so we have gathered a lovely panel. Um, and I think, first of all, we're going to have Callum Roberts. Um, Professor of Marine Biology from York University. He's going to kick things off. And now, like me, you've been obsessed with coral reefs for a very long time. Um, I think if anyone, if any of you have ever been an, are lucky enough to visit the tropics, you'll know just how wonderful these places are and how easy it is to fall in love with colourful, beautiful reefs. Um, and um, but you've since then devoted a uh, career to uh, understanding how protection um, in protected areas, marine reserves, can affect ocean and ocean life. And uh, you've worked um, a lot in figuring out how to make protected areas work as well as they can and as well as implementing them. Um, a lot of work on high seas protection, various other things. Um, you've advised the IUCN, the World Conservation Union, on uh, uh, assessing the threat to various different marine species and, and how they were doing. Um, but Callum doesn't only talk to an academic audience, he also writes um, various articles for the public and some other lovely books um, about the state of the oceans. So definitely catch those too if you want to find out more. But I'm just, other than that, I shall hand it over to you. Callum, thanks. Well, thank you very much, Helen. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, what I want to do to give you a sense of uh, the challenge in terms of marine protection and management is to tell you a little story uh, about a particular place in the sea uh, that many of you may have heard of. Uh, that's the Dogger Bank. Now, George Bernard Shaw was a, a, a renowned wit, and uh, he said, we learn from history that we learn nothing from history. And that's one of my favorite quotes. Uh, <laughs> un undoubtedly true. But I want to try and give you a little bit of history uh, about the Dogger Bank, which we can learn lessons from and that we should learn lessons from. Now, the Dogger Bank is uh, a remarkable place. It's a low hill in the middle of the, uh, of the, the kind of central North Sea. And it's, it's the moraine that formed at the end of an ice flow during the uh, last glaciation. And uh, it's an incredibly productive place year round uh, because cold, nutrient rich water comes in from the Atlantic around the north of Scotland and upwells across the bank. It's uh, uh, lifted up into nice warm water of the bank, relatively speaking, warm water. Uh, 
And uh, there it forms these fantastic plankton blooms that drives a whole food web, uh, which is extraordinarily rich. And because it's extraordinarily rich, people have been fishing there for a very long time. So if you go back to the 18th century, um, people used to take boats out there which had uh, a pool, swimming pool sized pool in the middle of them, which they would fill with fish uh, alive and then they would carry them back to various ports and they would keep them in cages and then uh, um, cull them when the market was ready for their fish. So principally they would catch things like cod and halibut, which were pretty hardy fish for uh, putting in pens and, and selling in places like London. The catch rates were absolutely extraordinary. And in, in 1840, there's a, a quote from the bank which said that eight fishermen fishing with hook and line for 10 hours uh, were able to catch 80 score of cod in a day. Now, 80 score, 1,600 fish, 200 fish per person, 10 hours, that's one fish every three minutes. Uh, during the whole course of the day. And you can imagine that it must have been a case of baiting the line, dropping the hook and pulling up the cod immediately and you had to keep doing this all day as fast as you could. The average sort of weight of a cod at that time on the bank was between 14 and 40 pounds. And so if you, if you take the, uh, the 14 pound end of that, uh, that's 10 tons of cod for a boat uh, in a day. Now that's, that's an extraordinary uh, number and it's going to be at the high end of the success rate for the Dogger Bank. But there are many other accounts of things like catching halibut and a typical catch of halibut from a line boat in the 1830s and 1840s would be something like a ton of halibut per day, which is a lot of fish. I mean, they, they heap up over the stage. Uh, they would be enormous too, many of them uh, greater than a metre long, metre and a half long, uh, big, hefty fish. Sometimes they would need to be hauled by two people to get them into the boat because they were that large uh, and heavy. Now, if you uh, uh, look at the history of the Dogger Bank, um, the, the line fisheries were replaced uh, into the mid-19th century by trawl fisheries. So bottom trawls uh, swept the seabed and uh, they caught enormous catches of fish. And so a, a sail trawler could catch something like two to three tons of fish in a three-hour trawl across about five miles of uh, seabed. And that is far, far greater than any fishing vessel can manage today from the same uh, swept area. So, so it was a, a very, very productive uh, place. Uh, through the 1860s into the 1870s, that increased as the fishing power increased. So they were catching uh, five or six tons of fish per tow uh, uh, 10 years on as the technology of trawling developed. And then they saw things starting to change. And so by the middle of the 19th century, at a time when they had the first fisheries inquiry uh, because of uh, perceived problems in the fishery and uh, worries about the destructive nature of bottom trawling, uh, people began to worry about the fall off in the abundance of halibut and skate on the Dogger Bank. And, and halibut in particular, uh, the catch rates indicate that there was something like a 90% decline in the halibut population from 1840 to 1860 or so. And it continued to decline as uh, fishing pressure built. Uh, the skates as well followed much the same trajectory. They were landed into ports on the east coast of the UK in, uh, by the cartload and then uh, in ones and twos and then uh, not at all as we move through the, uh, the 19th century. So the nature of the bank was changing dramatically and, and many common fish were also being depleted as well by the fishery. Now, Towards, um, well, uh, a few years ago, 2006 to 2009, um, uh, the Dogger Bank uh, has once again come to prominence because uh, it was declared a special area of conservation. And so the uh, Joint Nat Nature Conservation Committee uh, embarked upon a study of the Dogger Bank and, and looked at you know, how, uh, what the habitats were like, what the fish were like, in order to decide the conservation objectives for this area of seabed. And, and uh, what they found was that in the, the, the years that they were studying, the average catch of halibut on the bank uh, was two tons per year. And that's uh, from everyone. Remember, one ton per boat per day in the uh, 1840s. That's, uh, 
That's the scale of the difference. I mean, the, the, the halibut has declined more than a thousand times in, the, uh, in abundance on the bank. So have the skates, they've, they've gone extinct from that bank. There are many other fish species that have been completely depleted. So uh, the, the conger eels, for example, um, uh, wolf fish, these were fish that were once a mainstay of catches around the UK, um, which have subsequently uh, become very scarce. And um, the, uh, the, the JNCC report looks at the conservation objectives uh, for it um, and bases them in their entirety on the last 10 years. Now that is the wrong thing to do. If you want to have good conservation uh, around uh, the UK seas, you can't base things on a heavily depleted, completely changed ecosystem and say that uh, you know, you're going to base your management on essentially maintaining that sort of structure, which is what they have, have done. Uh, it's woefully inadequate as a, a conservation strategy and it essentially elevates worms to the, the, the top conservation value uh, above all of those things that have disappeared. There's no ambition to get any of that life back uh, in this conservation zone or in fact in pretty much any other conservation zone around the UK. And if you look at the proposed management measures for uh, Scotland's new marine protected areas, there are 30 of them, they were uh, established in 2014, uh, they propose to leave most of those uh, uh, marine protected areas open to scallop dredging and bottom trawling. So essentially what is the point in calling them marine protected areas if you're going to admit the two most destructive fishing methods of all in the, uh, the bounds of uh, those protected areas. The English marine conservation zones, uh, at the moment nobody knows what they're going to be protected from, but looking at the experience with special areas of conservation, uh, I don't think you can be very reassured that there's going to be a high level of conservation ambition. So there's a lot to be fought for um, in terms of uh, getting marine life the protection that it needs around the UK and uh, I think that protection needs to be implemented alongside management for fisheries but one thing is clear you can't have fisheries management deliver the recovery of these species that have uh, departed and have been depleted because there is no ambition to bring these species back uh, there are productive fisheries in their place uh, and so if we want to have um, protection for what are now endangered and some of them critically endangered species, we are going to need to embrace the concept of uh, strictly protected areas that are off limits to exploitation. So I shall leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Callum. So you've, I think we've set the bar, um, made the case very strongly for ambitious conservation in the oceans. Um, I particularly like the, the, the visuals you've given us of how big some of these fish used to be. I'm trying to imagine standing next to a metre and a half tall halibut and also watching three fish, uh, a fish come out every three minutes in a boat. That's quite a, a vivid image you've painted of, of how things uh, used to be and uh, perhaps started the discussion about protected areas and what they might do. But let's, um, let's move over to Barry to me here. Um, Barry is the Chief Executive of the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations, which is a group that gives a voice to fishermen across the UK. Um, and I, if I'm right, I believe that's no matter where they are, what size their vessels are, um, where they fish. So this is a voice, voice for the fishermen. And as an advocate for fisheries, um, Barry does various things. Seems like you're a, a man of many jobs, that you provide evidence to the government, um, write articles for the, for the press, um, appear in debates like this this evening. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and um, also on television. So I don't know if any of you are viewers of the BBC's Newsnight, but last year you um, took to the studio to uh, uh, discuss the issue of um, discards and bycatch with Hugh Fernie Whittingstall and did a very good job of, of a live te television interview, which must be absolutely terrifying. But uh, over to you, Barry. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, and um, thank you for the invitation here in um, such august surroundings and, and people. Um, I should draw a line about my uh, ar around my competence, which um, I'm only really um, experienced enough to speak about the Common Fisheries Policy and the Northeast Atlantic a bit. Um, but a, a couple of years ago, uh, in my office, so I'm, I'm not claiming any great scientific um, authority for it, but 
uh, we did a back of the envelope uh, exercise and we calculated that since the end of the Second World War, um, the fish that the British fishing fleet landed uh, constituted the basis for 200 trillion meals. And uh, it's a big number. I don't know if it's right, but it's, it's a big number. And that, yeah. I think um, the, the point is that it's a reminder that uh, fishing plays a, a fairly fundamental role in uh, the nation's food security. Um, and I think that's a point that often um, has got lost in the, in the debate about uh, the impact of, of fishing. Um, the key issue, as I understand it, is, is about how we can continue to make this contribution, um, this social good, if you like, uh, whilst minimizing the impact of fishing. And, and there is no denying that it has an impact, um, just like every other form of food production. Um, and of course, uh, it's important to note that um, how we achieve this takes place um, within the context of changing societal expectations. So uh, I in some sense, the, the industry gets very frustrated at the constantly moving goalposts, but that's just part of uh, the world that we, we live in and we have to uh, deal with. Uh, mistakes have certainly been made. Um, the common fisheries policy for most of its life has been a top-heavy, top-down and largely ineffective uh, management system for our, our fisheries. Um, and to a significant degree, um, I think it, it has caused the problems that we uh, now as an industry have to face. Um, the problems with North Sea Cod um, were caused by uh, fleet overcapacity. There was a, something called the Gadoid outburst um, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, where uh, there was a big explosion in, in the uh, population of, of Gadoid species, cod, haddock, whiting, etc. Um, and you saw the fleet responding to that. Ships were built um, to, to take advantage of this abundance. That was then supercharged by uh, EU grants, uh, and we had an overcapacity uh, issue. And that really, in a nutshell, is the problem with North Sea Cod. The Commission's solution, the Council's solution, the EU solution, uh, gave rise to large scale discards, and we're just having to deal with that now. But despite the shortcomings um, and mistakes, um, and certainly achieved in a more painful way than was necessary. If we look at fishing pressure, fishing mortality, um, right across the North Sea, uh, the North East Atlantic, so we're talking about Norway, Iceland, as well as the common fisheries policy, and we're talking about all of the main uh, species groups, so we're talking about the, the pelagics, the demersals, the benthics, so that's your herring and your mackerel, your cod haddock, white team, and your flatfish all of the main species groups, you have seen a dramatic reduction in fishing pressure from the year, around about the year 2000. And that is of the utmost significance. There's about a 50%, 50% reduction in fishing pressure. And you are seeing stocks responding. Um, North Sea Place in particular, dramatic uh, increase in, in the populations. Place, North Sea Place is now above anything that's previously been seen in the scientific record. Historical record is, is something different. We can argue about that. But in terms of the scientific record, you have a dramatic uh, increase. And there are other uh, stocks, Hake, for example, that following the same pattern. Others are more slow, as you would expect. But you see this, uh, as the pressure has been lifted, you see this recovery going on. Um, and we now have to deal um, fisheries management now has to start thinking about um, who eats who. Predation is so much more significant. In the North Sea, natural mortality in terms of uh, predation is much more significant than uh, fishing mortality. And we are now having to think, well, if we set this quota at this level, who's going to eat who and what's going to be left for who? Um, and that type of mixed fishery, multi-species management is now going to have to be uh, to come to the forefront in, in, in our thinking. Um, one of the interesting uh, points, uh, it's kind of counterintuitive in a way, is that the fishery with the largest discard, so we're talking about the flatfish, the beam trawl fishery for place and sole, um, 
the, the discards uh, count in, 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 in the thousands. And yet, this is exactly the species that is, is booming, that, that has increased so dramatically. So there's no obvious correlation between high levels of discards and uh, conservation status, which I think is, a, is an interesting point to, to ponder on. Callum's spoken uh, eloquently, as usual, as, uh, about um, marine protected areas. And um, I think we would say that uh, marine protected areas have an important role to, to play in protecting habitats and biodiversity. And there's a, a process uh, both at the European level and the domestic level for implementing them. No doubt not fast enough for Callum, but there we go. Um, but from our point of view, it's very important that the, their location, their shape, and size and purpose um, are based on sound knowledge. Otherwise, it becomes a tick box uh, exercise in gesture politics. They have been sold, um, oversold as a, a fisheries management tool. Um, if you want to increase uh, commercial species, um, there are other tools in the toolbox. Um, for my money, uh, getting the fleet capacity right through publicly funded decommissioning is the single most important thing that has happened in the last 20 years uh, to turn things around. Um, we have got a rough balance between the capacity of the fleet and the available resources. And you've seen other things where quota management can work, profitability in the industry can work, technical measures can work when you've got the, the, uh, the capacity uh, in balance. The, uh, closed areas, restricted areas can have a role. Um, there's, there's an area off North Cornwall, the Travose closure. It's a seasonal closure that we have supported um, because it's there for a purpose. It's there to protect co cod during the spawning season. Um, and it is, I wouldn't say it's welcomed enthusiastically by the industry, but it's accepted by the industry and it, it serves a purpose. Um, but closed areas are not the panacea that um, have been claimed by some. There are better tools in the, in the toolbox. So if we, if we look around, um, uh, what are the general lessons of the last um, couple of decades? Um, I think we would say that broad brush measures, um, they may be politically and administratively easier to introduce, but they will usually fail and cost more in the long term. So targeted measures, measures that are well thought through rather than a blanket knee-jerk reactions. Um, the point I made earlier, if you don't get fleet capacity aligned with the available resources, nothing else will work. Um, thirdly, the Nobel Prize winner, Eleanor Olstrom, demonstrated that um, bringing resource holders, the, the people involved in the fishery, into the design and implementation um, of management measures is absolutely critical to their success. That, that would be the, the third point. So I think the issue then becomes what are the institutional forms um, in which this can be achieved? And for my money, if you have the scientists, fishery scientists, uh, fisheries managers, the policy people, and the fishery stakeholders in the room, that is the institutional form that will deliver uh, effective management. And we are moving very slowly, uh, glacially slowly, you, you might say, uh, towards that in the, the shape of uh, advisory councils, regional advisory councils, um, and regional management. Thank you. Barry, thank you very much for that very uh, honest and uh, balanced view of, from the fishing industry. Um, mistakes have been made, but we can look forward. Um, and I think you've given us a really nice sort of recent overview of what's been going on over the last couple of uh, decades. Um, I'm certainly going to be um, using gadoid outburst as a phrase uh, <laughs> whenever I get the chance. That's <laughs> fantastic. But you make a couple of really, really important points, um, things we might want to, to pick up on, but generally kind of introducing the ideas of things like the importance of, you say, decommissioning, so essentially taking boats out of the water when um, to reduce the fishing, the fishing pressure, the amount of fish being caught, the the, the number of people out there doing this, um, and and also I think really important there you mentioned the involvement of stakeholders, of the users of the ocean, and I'm sure that's something that really is a common feeling with many, whether it's from the from the fishermen themselves or from the conservationists and everyone else that that's 
should really be part of the picture uh, and it is being brought in more and more um, in conservation and, and fishing management is it's the people who are out there um, on the ocean people who are making their livings from it they should be involved in these discussions and it, it makes it more effective in the long run so um, so thank you very much for that introduction uh, to um, things from your perspective I think we'll move on to our final panelist before you can all go off and get some of mine. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Alistair Harris, um, another marine biologist who has a big fondness for coral reefs, um, like two of us already. I don't know, we didn't actually ask Barry about how he feels about <laughs> coral reefs, but <laughs> that's <Super. weird. laughs> excellent. Um, um, Alistair is the founder of Br uh, Blue Ventures, um, a uh, an organisation that works with local communities um, in various countries, uh, sp particularly Madagascar, um, with the, the aim of um, rebuilding tropical fisheries, um, and working with local communities, um, and with the big aim of, of making conservation make economic sense, I think might be fair to say. Um, as well as being executive director of Blue Ventures, um, Alistair seems to keep himself incredibly busy working in various aspects of um, fishing um, and conservation advice, including a member of the, he's a member of the World Commission on P um, Protected Areas, and um, he's on the Stakeholder Council, that word again, stakeholder, the users, um, for the Marine Stewardship Council, so um, a group of the um, eco-labelling for, for, for sustainable fish. And I believe you're off tomorrow to Paris to talk about aquaculture to the World Conservation, no, the, the IUCN, the World uh, Conservation Union. So a man with many hats and very busy indeed, um, but um, over to you, Al, thanks. Thanks, Helen, and, and it's a great privilege to be here, to be able to share my thoughts with, uh, with such an august audience. Um, I'd like to take, shift our focus a little bit beyond the Northeast Atlantic, beyond the UK, um, and take a more global perspective on the challenges that we're, we're facing. Global demand for seafood is absolutely rocketing. Um, from the mid-90s when we were consuming about 75 million tonnes a year to today we're on 160 million tonnes. And with global populations set to mushroom from 7 billion today to 11 billion by 2050, this demand is only going to increase further. Given this, this soaring demand, I think it's fair to say that at a global perspective, most fisheries are in serious trouble. 90% of the world's fisheries are either fully exploited or overexploited. And compounding these problems, of course, we have huge challenges of data deficiency, particularly in the developing world, in the global south, weak management, very weak um, traction of market-based incentive mechanisms, um, particularly again in, in, in the South. So the situation is, is, as far as overfishing is concerned, is bleak and it's not evidently getting any better. Compounding these problems, of course, we have global climate change, local environmental degradation, ultimately leading to the collapse of the resources that we're talking about. We are living in the sixth mass extinction event and this is not just a biodiversity issue it's about the economies of coastal communities it's about food security as Barry said and it's crucially about food security for some of the most vulnerable people on the planet who are these people um, seafood is the primary source of animal protein for about a billion people worldwide anywhere between 600 and 800 million people that's around 12% of the planet depend on fishing for their livelihoods. And this is overwhelmingly concentrated in the global south. 97% of the world's fishers are in the developing world. Also in the developing world, we see a much greater dependence on seafood for food, much higher vulnerability to the impacts of a very, very rapidly changing ocean climate, the impacts of which we're already seeing in many tropical in subtropical countries from incre increased cyclonic activity to massive scale coral bleaching. With population growth on ongoing, of course, most of this is going to take place in the south and climate change is not going to make the, the challenge of managing these fisheries any easier. Um, most of the fisheries that we see in the developing world are what we call affectionately small scale fisheries, but I would argue that the only thing that's small about these fisheries is the size of their boats. They act largely under the radar, they're not recognised adequately by national or international policy um, frameworks, and they comprise largely subsistence, artisanal um, and traditional fisheries, and yet they number 97% of the world's 
fissures. This is a global issue. It's far too big to ignore. It is, it is not so small-scale fishing. Um, I want to relate that situation with where we stand today in marine protection. Globally, we're currently fully protecting less than 1% of our seas within fully protected no-take zones. Most of those, many of those, suffer serious management challenges because of a failure on the behalf of the conservation <coughs> sector to adequately engage the needs, the resource needs of coastal communities, particularly fishermen and women. Science tells us that we really need to be protecting about 30%, a third of our oceans, and we need to get there within the next generation if we're going to be able to safeguard our seas from the impacts that we know we're unleashing with global change. Funding for conservation is, is stagnant at best, um, and our sector remains fairly marginal relative to terrestrial conservation, relative to other areas of global development. Given the mounting pressures, how we are going to get from 1% protection to 30% protection in the next generation is, without a shadow of a doubt, the single greatest issue affecting the marine conservation sector today. How are we going to get there? I personally believe that the way we need to start thinking about this is to turn the challenge of engagement of, 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 of fishing communities into the solution that we're looking to, to bring to bear on the problem. Fishers are the solution to this problem. They shouldn't be seen as a barrier to conservation success. The great irony of marine conservation and marine protection is that fishing communities are the people that have the most to gain from marine protection. But these benefits are often seen as diffuse, they're often long term, and the opportunity cost to reap the dividends, the returns on a closed area, are often too much for fishing communities to bear. And so fishermen become adversaries rather than advocates for conservation, um, because the opportunity cost is too high. We, as conservationists, urgently need new tools to address that opportunity cost issue. How can we remove the opportunity cost, bring it down, so that we can catalyse interest at the grassroots, engage coastal communities in showing that fishing and marine conservation can work to enhance fishing productivity. The good news is that the win-wins do exist and the solutions are out there. Um, I'll opt for a bit of self-publicity here, but we just published a, a study last week in the Open Access Journal Plus One that shows that the use of periodic fisheries closures, similar to what Barry was referring to, in the island of Madagascar, which is one of the poorest countries on earth. This is a, a system of community-based fisheries management in which communities are closing about 20% of their fishing grounds for two to three months. It's been going on for the last decade in Madagascar. This study shows that these communities are increasing their catches for a month after these closures by 87%, and that translates to a monthly IRR of 92%, internal rate of return. That means these guys are doubling their money in a month through fisheries management. That's higher than any investment product on the market. Investing in fisheries recovery makes real financial sense. But what's most interesting to us is that these communities are now embarking on conservation efforts, permanent marine protected areas, that were absolutely inconceivable before they saw the economic benefits of fisheries management. Today, as a result of that model, 11% of Madagascar's inshore seabed is within locally managed marine protected areas, all driven as a result of, of that model that's catalyzed local interest in conservation by showing economic benefits. I think this offers a great shine of op opportunity of hope here in the UK to see that communities in one of the poorest countries on earth that depend overwhelmingly on fishing for survival are fighting for conservation. All too often I think we engage, our fishing sector engage, fights against conservation because we haven't got it right as conservationists. It's our obligation to show the economic benefits of the marine protected areas that we know we need to create. There are very encouraging signs of success here in the UK. The Community of Aran Seabed Trust is a really good example in Scotland of what can happen through local engagement in, in marine management. Um, I'll try to end there. I've got lots more I'd like to say. Um, but that's my flavour from, from the South.
Thanks ever so much, Alistair. That's great. I'm sure we'll have lots more to discuss um, after the break. But um, just just quickly to say, it's it's really interesting that you've you've put people back in that picture really clearly. I think that's uh, it echoes what Barry was saying as well about the importance of involving the people, the fishers who are, who are there, um, and and drawing us the global picture. Which so I think we've gone from from Dogger Bank to the Northeast Atlantic. To the, to the whole world, um, and we've um, got a nice a nice basis, I think, for going forwards with discussions. Um, so I think it's time uh, for us all to stretch legs, grab some more wine. There's plenty at the back, um, and then if we um, would like to, uh, re yeah, ten minutes. Should we say half past, half past seven? Should we sit down and um, carry on the scan? So and over that time, think think of lots of questions and things you'd like to discuss um, and bring up with our panel. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Brilliant. I hope you're all uh, well uh, topped up and ready for a discussion. Um, um, my name's Richard Scrace. I don't belong to any particular group. Um, when I was at school about 40 years ago, doing my A-levels, we had an exercise in how um, our country was overfishing and how fisheries had been declining for many years. And the science then and the science since has said that we needed to reduce our fishing efforts so that the fish could recover. And I could never understand why the combination of fishermen, policymakers, politicians seemed to ever listen to the science. And yet th then I had the good luck to be drinking in London one night and it just so happened that a group of people came in, civil servants, who'd just come back from fishery negotiations in Brussels. And I overheard the conversation and jumped in and said, why is it you can't achieve your job? Surely fishermen don't have that many votes. He said, well, the things we go and negotiate for a week, and by the end of the week, we're fed up, we want to come home. And the fishermen will, out, will stick it out. And so they end up winning. Now that sounds to me like a rather gross simplification of what happened over a week. But, but Barry, you talked about a glacial process. Um, can you tell me why that process is so glacial? Yes. Um, where to begin? Um, well, the, the, the things are changing. Um, I mean, start with the science. Um, let's, let, let's talk about this in terms of science and then talk about policy. Um, we used to have one meeting a year with uh, the scientists. That's when they told us what their recommendations were for the coming year's quotas, um, which were invariably heading in a downward direction. And um, th those meetings were horrific, a bloodbath. You scroll forward um, maybe 15 years, uh, to now, and um, it's a much, much better relationship. We have things called fishery science partnerships where um, fishermen and scientists collaborate on projects that are um, suggested by the industry, um, funded by government um, with declining budgets, um, and that not only provides useful data, um, but also has transformed the relationship between fishermen and scientists. We, the, the science is provided um, within the Common Fisheries Policy by ICES, the International Council for Exploration of the Sea, based in Copenhagen. Um, at one time, somebody, well, somebody described it as a black box that emitted smoke, and we weren't allowed to look into that black box. Well, scroll forward, and we don't have the, the human resources to be able to attend all the meetings that we're invited to. You know, there are strategy meetings, there are data compilation meetings, there are benchmark meetings. So there's a huge change, um, and uh, I think that helps uh, fishermen understand the science. I think uh, the science benefits from the dialogue with the industry. Um, on the policy side, um, progress is slow because the European Union is slow. Um, and if you take as your premise that the the fundamental problem with the common fisheries policy, it's trying to manage a huge number of diverse fisheries across 40 degrees of longitude or latitude. It's an enormous area. 
And there's a recognition that that model just doesn't work. And the recent reform has accepted that a degree of decentralization is, is required. The trouble is that that has taken, from, from the original concept in the late 1990s, it's taken to 2013 to, to come uh, around. On the, in the other direction comes co-decision making, where, where the European Parliament now has, has uh, involvement. And um, well, an indiscreet commission official said, well, we've moved from a situation where 23 people who didn't know what they were talking about make the decisions to a situation where 674 people who don't know what they're talking about make the decisions. And uh, there's an element of truth in that. Regionalization means that um, well, we have the, the advisory councils, which are the stakeholders, including the NGOs. Uh, but we also now have, um, although it's very much in its infancy, but we have a situation where member states uh, cooperating at, at regional seas level, so North Sea or Northwest waters, um, can make recommendations, joint recommendations, that all other things being equal go through the process and become law. That is a much more flexible system. It's a step in the right direction. Um, I would, I would, I'm an advocate, advocate for going much further for uh, decisions to be made in the wheelhouse of the, ve of the vessel within a system of supervision. So fishermen sign up to um, uh, a vision, uh, a, a more of a kind of contractual relationship about how they will fish sustainably. Um, and that gets you away from all the micromanagement that, that has really um, not had a great record of, of success. So it's, um, it, is, it is a long, slow uh, job. It's very complex. There are things that are moving in the right direction, there are some countervailing influences, but I don't think we've got much option then to, to keep pushing. Thanks, that's great. Um, briefly, Jared, if you have other comments on the pace of change, or should we move on to more questions? <coughs> I, I can make one comment on pace of change. Uh, there has been change, and um, those of you who might have been keen viewers of Hugh's Fish Fight will have noticed that uh, there has been legislation to reduce discarding from boats. I say reduce, not eliminate, because um, a common misperception is that uh, the, the discarding is being ended, but only for the species which are managed by quotas. So you can still throw away half of your catch if it's made up of things which are non-quota species. So, uh, you know, that includes a lot of these uh, threatened species I was talking about earlier. So it's, it's not far enough. Um, another of the reforms of the common fisheries policy recently was that we should be fishing at maximum sustainable yield for fish stocks and that there, therefore we would end overfishing within Europe by fishing at maximum sustainable yield, which um, is, uh, it, it, it's a move in the right direction, but there's um, a couple of problems with maximum sustainable yield now. Number one is that the commission uh, declares success in fishing at maximum sustainable yield, not when the stock has recovered to the level that uh, will achieve maximum sustainable yield, but when they reduce fishing pressure sufficiently that eventually, given enough time, the stock will recover to that level. So in other words, it's, uh, you know, trust me, the stock will recover if we fish it at this level. And there's no guarantees on that, frankly. There are many examples of reducing fishing pressure and things haven't come back. The other problem with maximum sustainable yield is that when I started my career as, uh, in fisheries, it represented half of the, uh, the weight of uh, an unexploited stock. So in other words, you could fish down half the stock and you'd hit the maximum productivity um, uh, and that's the maximum sustainable yield level. But if you want to uh, achieve maximum sustainable yield in more fisheries, the, the simple thing to do is to downgrade that target. And that's what's been happening underneath the radar over the years, is that we're now down to uh, maximum sustainable yield being calculated as when the stock is at 25 or 30 percent of its unexploited uh, size. So um, that's, that's something which hasn't really been discussed very much in the open, and I think it needs to be, because what we're seeing is far less precautionary targets being introduced now. So there is progress. I, I accept that. I think there's, there's been good progress. The industry is um, engaging with uh, uh, scientists uh, to a, a much greater extent. It's not yet engaging enough with conservationists, I have to say, 
um, at uh, Barry's comments earlier about um, marine protected areas were all very much made from within the context or from within the assumption that everywhere should be fished uh, because um, the sea is there for fishing. Whereas I would say that's, that's not the case. You know, there is a good case for putting areas off limits to fishing to give nature space alongside fisheries and to use the environment in a balanced way. And so we, we're coming at it from different directions here, I think, and, and different underlying uh, 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 assumptions. OK. Al? Perhaps I could, I could add one, one more theme on, on the review of the Common Fisheries Policy in, in 2012, 2013 that was overlooked was the fact that the, the food security that Barry refers to here in, in the EU and the UK on EU fisheries, our, our, the, the seafood that we consume is not just from the EU. The EU fleet operates far beyond the borders of the EU. The distant water vessels which are paid for by us, the EU taxpayers, are fishing in the coastal waters of, of other nations, third party nations, distant water fleets we call them under access agreements. Now often these agreements are signed with states that very much need the revenue um, and don't have the capacity for monitoring, control and surveillance of their territorial waters. Um, if I could perhaps use the same country as an example that I referred to earlier, Madagascar has one of the largest tuna fisheries in the southwest Indian Ocean and the largest tuna fleet in Madagascar's EEZ, Madagascar doesn't have a domestic tuna fleet, is, is the EU, which has about 124 vessels or, or something thereabouts, the last agreement, and pays 1.3 million euros for the right to fish a fishery that, whose landed value is probably about 60 to 80 million euros. So there, there is a, a global rights to food issue tied up with the CFP that has been massively overlooked in the context of the reform. Yes, fisheries are incredibly important for, for food security in this country, but they're seriously undermining the food security of some of the poorest people on earth. And we're paying for that. Great. I think we should take some more questions. Right. OK, let's send a microphone to the lady there. And how about another one to the gentleman down here? And we'll, we'll get going. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Matilda Evans. Um, I actually worked with Coast on my master's thesis um, last year, so I'm quite familiar with the situation. My question was for Alistair. I was going along the lines of what you've just mentioned. I was going to ask, in terms of, obviously you're developing really successful schemes with the local fishermen, and they now have their locally managed um, marine areas. And I was wondering, in terms of official protection, if some commercial venture was then to come and get involved and think, ooh, I've looked at your article, I've seen your production increase and all of those great numbers that you've published, which is fabulous for the local fisheries and you know, for the environment. Where's the risk with a government like Madagascar, which obviously is prone to corruption and you know, the economic problems that they have? Have you faced any of that yet? I would argue that the success of a fisheries enhancement-based conservation strategy hinges on the engagement of the private sector. Um, so that's, I would see, as an opportunity. If we're, if we're seeing increased value from more sustainable fisheries management mm -hmm. up the supply chain, then that's exactly what we, we want to be working towards. Um, I would certainly never suggest that locally managed marine areas, which work very well in a very poorly governed marine environment, like the Western Indian Ocean, are a panacea. It's illegal in this country. <laughs> you can't go and declare, declare a, sacrifice a cow and de declare an area closed to fishing um, for very good reason here. Um, but I think we, it needs to be part of the solution. Um, and certainly, it's in the hands of, of the small scale fishers in the developing world that we really need to put the scaling of conservation because we can't get to that 30% without them. They have to be the agency through which we operate. Um, the models that I've referred to have been effectively implemented through what one might call top-down approaches in other jurisdictions. The government of Mauritius took on board that same model and implemented it through fisheries legislation. So I think one has to work within the context of the uh, jurisdiction and the governance setting in which we're, we're, we're operating. Um, one of the things that I guess I've noticed in my career spending um, 
most of it working with, with fishes in the tropics, is, is how closely uh, the, the, the enormous ecological awareness that small-scale fishes have far greater than me as a marine biologist with degrees and things. They're totally irrelevant in compared to comparison to the scale of this, this really, really strong knowledge. And, and it, it, it's just another um, example of the, the need to engage with communities in, in a leadership role. Fantastic. Let's go to the next question over here. OK. Um, is this on? Yes. Uh, my name's Jeff Meaden. I'm employed by the uh, FAO of the UN as a consultant. Uh, my present uh, unenviable task is to develop a marine spatial plan for the Persian Gulf. Um, I'm amazed that the, the whole concept of marine spatial plan wasn't actually mentioned here because, uh, as you will, as the people on the panel will know, places like the Irish Sea and the Baltic Sea and the Coral Sea off Australia Cal and the Sea off California have marine spatial plans. Um, you wouldn't imagine that the terrestrial areas of the Earth could be managed without planning. It would be impossible. And it's only with planning that things are all going to work, work sustainably. Um, the marine areas are used by uh, fishing industry, I've got a list here, shipping, recreation, building development, oil, gas and wind, military, conservation, aggregates, etc. Well, if they were to have a free-for-all, which it doesn't quite as bad as that at the moment, but it could theoretically be. Um, if we had it all planned out nicely, then um, things would happen sustainable, sustainably for all of the activities. At the moment, things are not happening sustainably for fisheries, because all the other people are, have much more power and influence than fisheries than fishermen have. So I would like to see marine uh, spatial planning develop. Uh, even in our English Channel or our North Sea, we don't have this type of management. Uh, could the panel comment on where we, are, where we are at with MSP? Thank you. Would anyone like to just give a, in a nutshell, we gave a lovely introduction mm -hmm. to marine <coughs> spatial planning, but perhaps to sort of underline what that is. Well, there, there is a, um, a move towards marine spatial planning in the UK uh, under the Marine and Coastal Access Act, and uh, the Marine Management Organisation is in charge of developing marine spatial plans, and it's, uh, it's uh, doing a trial area at the moment. And, and essentially we mean d d deciding where different activities can happen in the ocean, mm. planning, mapping it out physically. And you, yes, yes, let's just make sure we're all up to speed on, on that. So marine spatial planning, great. So the, the, uh, you've, you've given me a very good exam question for next year. You know, if we had marine spatial planning, we would have all of our activities sustainably uh, operating in the sea. Discuss. <laughs> and uh, and I, I fear that that will not be enough. And it all depends on what your aims are. And uh, one of the aims in the, the waters of Europe is to achieve good environmental status by 2020 under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. But if your definition of what good environmental status is, is based on uh, five or 10 years of data on what the sea looks like at the moment, then you're, you're setting yourself up for low ambition in terms of uh, recovery of the sea. So I think w you, you have to uh, also think about um, providing protection uh, which will enable the sea to tell you what is enough protection, to do it experimentally, to develop management that will lead you in the right direction in terms of uh, recovery and uh, rebuilding of stocks and habitats. Um, and, and that way, you know, rather than assuming the answer and saying it's fine to trawl in all of our marine protected areas um, and, uh, and, and never finding out that actually you could have had something completely different in those protected areas, if you'd really protected them from that impact. Uh, it's got to be experimental and, and uh, uh, developmental, I think. Sustainability has to be the aim that you're making for sustainability for all stakeholders. Well, sustainability is a little bit of a misused word. And if I might just add one point here, which, uh, uh, or, or rather, it's, it's, a, it's a weasel word. It's a weasel word because uh, some of our most destructive fisheries are our most sustainable ones. And um, you know, that, that surprises people when they think about it. Surely a sustainable fishery is one where everything's hunky-dory and, and everybody's happy, the wildlife is happy, the crabs have all got smiles on their faces. The, the answer is it's not, actually. Um, and if you look at the species that have, uh, that, that have come to dominate in heavily exploited ecosystems, 
Uh, on the Dogger Bank, the major fisheries today are for nephrops, prawns, uh, for dabs, place, and um, for sand eels. And these are things which uh, breed prolifically. They are uh, the, the, the rats and cockroaches of the sea. And so they have very high population turnover rates. They can cope with the removals that we're, we're doing by fishing. They can cope with very heavy destructive fishing gears impacting on habitats. They're quite happy with it, just as rats and cockroaches are happy uh, thriving in, in, in pretty heavily human impacted environments. But we don't want those everywhere. Uh, and if we're going to have wildlife conservation in the ocean, then we need to curtail the footprint of those uh, fisheries recognizing that sustainability in itself is not an adequate goal. Would you like to well, add some thoughts? Dogger banks made of sand. Um, well, it, it is now. <laughs> nephrops live in mud, so uh, I, don't, I, don't think, um, I don't think it's been a nephrops uh, fishery for some time. Marine spatial planning is coming. It's, it's on its way. Um, as Cam says, the marine management organizations. There's, there's two, there's an eastern area and a southern area, experimental. Coexistence is really what it's about. Um, and I mean, it's quite interesting that the fishing industry um, has developed ways of coexisting with oil and gas, renewables, cable industry, um, quite well through um, dialogue you know, and so there are quite sophisticated arrangements in place already but I suppose they'll be incorporated into into it but I mean I think the, the issue of the discard ban the landings obligation is part of this this picture of, of uh, a sustainable um, fishing industry within a sustainable ecosystems being raised my opinion at the moment is that the biggest threat to um, sustainable fishing um, and the direction that we've been heading in for the last 10 years is the land use obligation. Um, it, it was badly drafted, badly conceived, panic measure brought in, um, no doubt about it with um, the assistance of Hughes Fish Fight. Um, and we are now facing, and the scientists are facing, um, fundamental changes which um, don't necessarily move in the direction of, of sustainable fishing. Um, we have um, a, a top-down approach. Um, for example, um, the North Sea uh, Place fishery, um, where we have uh, a situation where the stock is going in the right direction, um, but it's, it's a high discard fishery. Um, and that is probably something to do with the fact that the evidence suggests that um, it's quite a high level of survival. So for those species, the, the, the fish that goes back um, survive and contribute to the biomass. If you look at the round fish fishery, um, so your cod had it quite in the, in the North Sea. I actually have a graph here, which I brought along. Um, that's 20 years of discards, and you can see there's a, something like a 90% reduction. So what we were doing uh, over that period was reducing fishing pressure we were also reducing discards by 90%. The difficulty uh, that we now face, um, and the scientists face, the relevance of their models, because all of that's going to change, the, the fishing patterns are going to change. In terms of spatial management, where fishermen fish is going to change. And that, that is one of the problems, one of the challenges for spatial management. Uh, where we fish now in order to uh, uh, have an economic fishery might be different under, under a discard ban. So um, marine spatial planning is where we've got to go. Um, I think it's probably not a good idea to rush it because there's so many different um, dimensions, not least of all the how to, how to um, deal with this piece of legislation, the landings obligation that is coming at us like a train. So maybe we need to slow that down, talking the speed. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm, I see that time is ticking, so let's get through some more questions. Perhaps if we take three and then give our, um, our panel time to think about that. So let's go. Do you want to hand to that gentleman there? And would you like to come in here to the lady in the green top? And we'll do those two and then we'll get a third one. So yeah, go for it. Hi, uh, my name is um, Will McCallum. I'm Head of Oceans at Greenpeace UK. And I'm just 
I guess we focus a lot on the solutions uh, aspect to it, the kind of marine protected areas, and you know, Alistair says 30%, and Greenpeace's position is 40%, but that's, that still leaves 60 or 70% of the ocean that needs to be left for sustainable fishing. And it's nice in the UK, we're in a kind of, like Barry's organisation in Greenpeace, we might disagree on some things, but in a way we're in a luxury position of talking about solutions and kind of roughly aiming for similar areas sometimes, uh, a lot of the time. And, um, but actually there are some fundamentally bad players out there that we're trying to tackle. There are transshipments, there are longliners, there's IU vessels kind of all over the place. And we're stuck in this position of not knowing really how to tackle this massive, you know, the 60 or 70% of the high seas uh, that we need to have sustainable fishing in. And I just wondered whether you've got kind of thoughts or examples actually from your research of successful measures being taken to tackle some of those worst industry players who I think there will be no disagreement in this room are doing some pretty horrendous uh, activity out there. That's a great question. We'll hold that for a second. Let's have our next one. Oh, do we have? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Um, so my name is Amy McCourt. I work in finance in the charity and not-for-profit sector. Um, this is sort of a specific question. Uh, talking about the increased trend, and we've discussed uh, place by Barry Dees, um, specifically with that, if the status quo is maintained, uh, will that be able to continue? Um, and if so, tied in with Callum Roberts' point, what's, if, if not, sorry, what is the barrier of reaching the historic levels of biomass? And if we could, if possible, kind of tailor that to, as a consumer, my impact can be through supply and demand. So my three areas of consideration would be perhaps, is there a part of the food chain most concerned? So fishing plankton for fish oil, for example. Is it habitat and the style of fishing? Or is it just sheer quantity that would impact that? Okay, so we've got a few questions wrapped up in there. I think that was great. <laughs> Shall we just, let, maybe we should stick with those two for now um, and see where we get. Um, so our first question was um, about the big baddies, um, illegal fishing, um, long lining, some of these um, really, um, really tough issues we've got to deal with um, in fishing. We haven't really touched on them so much tonight. Um, would any of you three like to, to comment on that at this stage? Um, perhaps, perhaps Al, would you have any thoughts on, or any, have we thought of any positive cases in which those sorts of problems, illegal, unreported fishing, have been dealt with? Well, I'll start off with a negative, if I may. Sure. Um, <laughs> firstly, I would, I would um, speak to your point about our sector being woefully ill-prepared to deal with the scale of this challenge. You refer to high seas, areas beyond national jurisdiction, 50% of the planet, we don't know what's going on out there, transshipments, illegal fishing. Um, there are some very exciting initiatives, the Port State Measures Initiative, which is being driven by Pew, um, keeping uh, vessel IDs so that we can make, keep a track on where these reefers are going and the reefers are the vessels that are doing transshipment. So we should um, just say that transshipment is, is when um, fish is unloaded from one boat to another essentially at sea so it's hard to then track where it was caught and, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, and also of course the role that, that technology can play. Everybody's now looking to terrestrial and marine drones um, and all of the, the new low-cost tech that could be used to help um, police the high seas. Um, I would argue, though, that we can't even seem to get it right here in the UK as far as the baddies are concerned. Um, I mentioned in a chat earlier the, the, the French supermarket chain, Intermarché, which um, runs the, the, the deep-sea trawl fishery that operates off the coast of Scotland and is um, hooking up large numbers of endangered species every day. Um, to, feed, to feed French consumers being subsidised by the European taxpayer. There are a lot of baddies out there. I think fundamentally, from my perspective, our sector needs to grow. We have a role to play, you particularly have a role to play, in championing this mission, in raising awareness of the fact that the high seas are 50% of the planet. We don't have long to act on these issues. Um, there are good news solutions out there but the scale of the, the challenge is, is enormous. Um, and most of the developing world and the tropical developing world doesn't have the capacity to enforce fishing legislation within territorial waters, let alone in areas beyond natural jurisdiction. Um, where I used to live in Madagascar, a million square kilometers of EEZ with three or four zodiacs to police it comes back to the MSP question, is it feasible in, in such a 
in, in these countries where, where, where capacity is so low. In the Persian Gulf, of course, they've got the capacity in some countries to double the length of their coastlines through coastal hardening. But um, yeah, I think we need to be realistic. Um, and Callum, do you want to briefly mention the steps we're at at the moment um, in terms of the UN agreements on, on putting protected areas in the high seas? Um, perhaps just yeah. a, a little brief introduction to what's, what's going on at the moment. Well, the high seas, there's no uh, um, instrument at present to create marine protected areas in the high seas. So we're, we're busy doing the science to try and identify places that are important, uh, where wildlife is threatened. Um, that's pretty much everywhere, actually, uh, across the high seas. And uh, just within the last week, the United Nations General Assembly has voted to uh, uh, negotiate an implementing agreement for marine protected areas in the high seas. So that's hopefully going to be completed within two years, and then we will be at a point where we can start to introduce marine protected areas. But I think we need to be bolder than that, actually. Um, on the high seas because at the moment we have something like 18 regional fisheries management organizations which are responsible for various bits of high seas management. Um, they operate under the auspices of the United Nations and the Food and Agriculture Organization and they are fundamentally flawed. Their constitutions are not sufficiently broad to safeguard the environment and to make sure that the environmental quality is sufficient to continue delivering us fish. They, uh, they, they uh, um, promote sovereignty issues over any question of resource management. So in other words, uh, if a country disagrees with um, a measure to manage a resource more effectively, then it, that, that management measure doesn't get implemented in most cases. They're, they are run under consensus rules, and so they're, they're completely hopeless at uh, protecting the high seas right now. And given that, um, I, I would argue we should stop fishing the high seas completely. We should introduce a moratorium on high seas fishing until those management organizations are reformed in such a way that uh, they are capable of delivering good environmental management and long-term sustainability in fisheries. Because at the moment, what we have is a mining operation across most of the high seas. And it's benefiting a handful of countries that are geared up for high seas exploitation. Um, so it's in incredibly iniquitous. You know, most of the poorer countries of the world get no say in the high seas. Um, it's all going to the big players, the industrial uh, nations who, who are out there with their fleets extracting as fast as possible. So um, I can't help you with what we need to do. I think the Port States Agreement, if that measure was introduced and, and we start tracking boats on the high seas and uh, catching the ones that are uh, are uh, fishing in the most egregious ways, that will be good. Um, and it's also about uh, uh, human rights um, and welfare issue that we need to do that because those are also the places where human rights are being most soundly abused, I think. And, and there's all sorts of issues of slavery and bonded labor and uh, appalling uh, employment practices, etc., etc., which go with those illegal fisheries. So. But it's it's a, a weeping sore on the world's uh, uh, conscience, I think. Okay, right. I'm going to whiz on to the next question. I really, um, I, I think you had several parts, but if you may, if I may, I think I'd like to focus in on the idea of consumers and um, and, and what choices consumers can make and perhaps sort of uh, where they could best be focusing their efforts to try and take part in in pushing for good and for for more sus sort of sustainable fishing. I think that's sums up hopefully what you were asking. Um, Alistair, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of, well perhaps Callum as well, I know you've just ended the last question, but perhaps that is, is, is a good one for you to answer. Um, well Barry made the point that um, food, fish is a, a very important food source and I, I have no uh, shame in saying that I still eat fish and uh, I enjoy fish and it's good for us and it's healthy, but there is a dwindling supply of it in many places and, and Europe imports 60% roughly of the fish it consumes, so so we are. Uh, it's incumbent on us to make sure that it's not just our own fisheries that are better managed, but those from overseas. Having said that, if if uh, I, my my list of species that I can eat is pretty short, um, so I avoid things that are uh, high in the food web. Apart from so, in other words, the big predators, except for pole and lion caught tuna, which <laughs> is the you know, you, where you've got uh, things like skipjack and yellowfin tuna being caught using uh, essentially very uh, selective methods 
that is a good way of, of catching it. Unlike Persanes, which basically are catching a whole range of bycatch, turtles, sharks, dolphins, all sorts of things as well. And don't trust a dolphin-friendly label because in the Eastern Pacific, where a lot of these dolphin tuna interactions take place, they, they let the dolphins go, but every time they've chased down a school of, uh, a pod of dolphins and caught the tuna, the dolphins are stressed out. They've separated young from adults, so they're not reproducing effectively uh, in the way that they were. So this is just, you're not seeing bleeding dolphins coming up in the winch uh, very often anymore, but uh, it's having an impact on them for sure. So I avoid things like uh, dredge caught uh, fish and trawl caught fish because they're so unselective and they do a lot of damage to the seabed. And in terms of aquaculture, um, go low in the food web, which is uh, things like um, uh, mussels and, and uh, actually um, uh, rope grown scallops too. That's, that's a good way to eat scallops. If you can't bear to give up scallops, go for rope grown scallops uh, in aquaculture. So it, it, you know, there's, there's no easy issues and it's hard to get the information. So if you want to make a difference, you know, go and ask the people in your supermarkets, you know, what are you doing for sustainability? And I think Barry will agree. There's been a lot of uh, improvement in the retail sector as to ensuring better sustainability of the fish that they're stocking and, and better traceability yeah, of some, where they're coming from. Some thoughts from Barry. A bit under time pressure. I here, think so. um, the first thing to say is that yes, 60% um, of uh, fish consumed in Europe is imported. But look where it's coming from. Um, there's a million tonne TAC of Barents Sea Cod from Norway. Uh, it's about more than half of that, um, 500,000 or something, come from Iceland. Most of them are coming from the north. Um, uh, tuna would be the exception. So it's, it's important um, to realize that the most important um, third country agreement that the EU has is, is a reciprocal arrangement with, with Norway. Um, as to the consumers, well, consumers might, um, when they're asked, fill in a questionnaire and put the environment high on, the, uh, on their list. Uh, but when they um, choose uh, what they put in their trolley, it tends to be price and value. Um, and that's just the reality. And so I'm always a bit skeptical about um, the impact that um, uh, certification has. Um, I think that um, fishing industry um, organizations, uh, individual vessels, um, are interested in um, MSC accreditation primarily to keep their uh, market open. It's, it's about market access rather than any premium that they, they receive. So um, that the other thing is, is the degree to which um, certification schemes reward low-hanging fruit. But do they change anything? That would be my, my question. Um, it, it's very indirect if they do. Um, the... Um, I, I think the most, as I said earlier, the, the most direct um, way to put yourself on track for sustainable fishing um, is to get your fleet in line with your available resources. Then other things can work. And um, yeah, perhaps certification uh, does play a role, but in my list of, of items, it would be quite low down. Okay. My name is Emma McLaren. I work with Sustainable Fisheries Partnership. Um, we are a charity, um, global charity, and we work with the retailers that have just been referred to. So my hand went up really quickly because you're talking about um, the individuals and the companies that I work closely with. Um, and I like that Callum has actually noticed that there is actually an improvement yes. um, because that is true. Um, there has definitely been a bit of a change and a lot of that is because of the certification. So um, pushing fisheries towards certification um, and uh, improving them through um, projects and, uh, and different ventures um, actually does improve things in the water. Um, and we're um, currently researching and conducting um, some deep research on how that is and why that is um, and to show um, the validity of um, improvement projects working towards MSC. But um, in terms of the consumer, I think a lot of us have the privilege um, to make that choice of rope grown scallops and most of the people in the world don't. They want a good price and a good quality product um, and um, it's nice to work with other NGOs to try to get these 
um, companies across the board and even intermarché if we can get to them um, across the board so that the consumer doesn't have to think about whether this fish is caught by slaves or killing the sea bottom or anything like that. It's, uh, it's across the board. Um, so just a quick comment, I guess. Thank you very much for that comment. That's great. I'm sorry we didn't get through everyone's questions. I think um, certainly it's obvious to me that this is a huge topic and we could go on and on. Um, but thank you all so much for, for being here and for taking part. Um, personally, I think something, two things I'm going to take away from this. Well, actually, one wrapped up in one actually idea, which is the idea of time. We've, we've talked about the sort of big history, well, the last hundred years, perhaps. Um, mostly 300. Of 300 years of fishing um, and the changes that have taken place in that time and then focused in on, on the more recent past um, and the last few decades and discussed the pace of change and how at the moment things do seem to be going rather slowly um, whether in the changes and the, the, uh, the, the policies that kind of grind away but hopefully are slowly pushing in the right direction so time for me I think is definitely running out today um, so those are my thoughts um, Alistair can I perhaps ask if you've got something you might um, take my, away from this. My take home is, is really it's, it's to applaud um, the British Library for bringing people like Barry and Callum and, and, and me together. We all work in the same blue world, um, but we rarely meet. And I think for too long, the currency of conservation has, has revolved around peer-reviewed literature and publications, and, and that's where we stop. But change is about relationships and change is about dialogue. and, and, and understanding perspectives um, and it's incredibly valuable that, that these relationships continue to be to be grown and nurtured and, and um, thanks to my panelists. Thank you. Callum? So if this had been 10 years ago uh, it would have been a different kind of conversation because I think things have moved in a, a positive direction in the last 10 years in the waters around Europe certainly. Uh, we've seen positive moves towards ending overfishing in, in many ways. We've seen positive move, moves towards establishing networks of marine protected areas. We haven't yet figured out that if you want a protected area to work, it has to have a high level of protection. And so that will be the next stage. And we do need to battle on with that point for some time uh, forth. But there are benefits to having those protected areas for fisheries. I've emphasized the conservation need for them today, but there, are, uh, there is strong science behind them and it, it's, it's not really being oversold, I think, Barry. I, I think that uh, the science behind the contribution that marine protected areas can make to fisheries is getting more and more solid year by year. And, uh, and they will help bring up stocks and they will help us to manage the seas more sustainably as a whole. And so I think uh, there's, there's ample uh, space for fisheries and conservation to live alongside one another. Thank you, Callum. And Barry, would you like to share some thoughts before we let everyone go? Well, I suppose um, what Callum describes there is, is advocacy and, and a belief. Um, I think science is about, about knowledge, um, always provisional knowledge and always something we can, we can do more in. I mean, in terms of, of time, um, we talked about the slow rate of political uh, change, um, and that's just something that we have to deal with um, and try and chevy along. On the, on the biological front, um, the, it, it's rather different. We have, in the Northeast Atlantic, reduced fishing pressure. Um, it's now a case of watching what happens. So we're seeing, as a, the example of places, the best one, the Hague, um, there are other nephrops. We see these, uh, these stocks coming back up very rapidly, but not all of them. There are other stocks that are um, not moving. And uh, one of the interesting scientific um, observations uh, recently that I heard was that you know, maybe um, the focus on our recovery plans of, of two to three years, or at the outside five years, is just unrealistic. Biology recruitment takes time. Um, and it, it's also taking place against uh, the background of a changing ecosystem. Um, water temperature change is, is, a, is a reality. Um, and that's going to have impacts on uh, what recovers, where it recovers, and how fast it recovers. And I think that's something that we have to bear in mind. 
Yes, we didn't even get to climate change. That's how much time <laughs> pushed on us. And um, that's all we have time for. Thank you all. Um, well, first of all, I should very much thank um, our panellists, uh, to Alistair Harris, uh, Callum Roberts and Barry Dees for coming along and uh, talking so eloquently about their particular views and areas of expertise. Thank you all for coming. And for those of you who managed to get your questions in, sorry to everyone else who didn't. But I hope we've at least given you some, thought, some food for thought um, to just continue the discussions between yourselves, amongst yourselves, over Twitter, other things other means of putting those ideas out there um, and it is it's huge the oceans cover seven tenths of the planet we weren't going to nail it in an hour and a half but uh, I think we did a pretty good job so thank you very much